It's this equipping the saints ministry training. Uh, tonight we're going to do an overview of Luke chapter 4 verse 18. We're going to look at uh, what Jesus said when he went into the temple and he picked up the scroll. He found where it was written and he read out of the book of Isaiah. And uh, he said the spirit of God is upon him and anointing him to preach and to heal and to, to deliver. So we're going to look at that. Preaching the gospel. All believers must be equipped to know the gospel message and to give it. All believers. It's simple, but we need to study to show ourselves approved. So number one, we're going to look at the gospel message. We're going to look at healing and deliverance. And we want to get equipped. Okay? So let's read Luke 4, verse 18. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. He went into the temple as was his habit, as was his custom. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Gospel means good news. He, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable or the acceptable year of the Lord. So he's quoting out of Isaiah 60, 61, I'm sorry. And uh, look at what it, how it begins. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's the word of God. The gospel is the word. Agreed? Yes. This is the word, the Lord Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. The word is up in the temple speaking the word. And he's saying the word is saying I've been anointed to declare the word. So everything that follows, the healing of the brokenhearted, the liberty of the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, and the favorable year of the Lord, all of that springs from the word of God. Okay, Psalm 107 verse 20 says, He sent his word and healed them of all their destructions. Healing, deliverance, freedom, it all comes from the Word of God. Okay? So we're going to break this down. We're going to look at it so that we can get a simple overview in our heart of a simple gospel message that everybody can share. Now, by way of reference, I did a message. It's on YouTube. It's called The Gospel of the Kingdom. It's about 30 minutes long, and it's only Scripture verses. I put together a compendium of Scripture verses Telling of the birth, life, death, resurrection, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And I, I wrote all the scriptures out and I just read it. So there you have, you can listen to it on YouTube. It's called the gospel of the kingdom. If you'll listen to that message three or four or five times, you'll get it in your spirit what the gospel message is. Amen. You'll get it in you and then it'll just come out. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll bring to your remembrance the words that I've spoken. So if you'll invest time getting the word into you, when it's time to share it, the Holy Spirit will bring it to your remembrance. Okay? So there's, there's Luke 4.18. That's what Jesus said. The, the Holy Spirit was upon him for this reason. Resting upon him for this reason. To preach, to heal, to proclaim freedom. To bring sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, and proclaim the favorable or acceptable year of the Lord. There's the anointing. Now, all of those things, you can sum it up like this. To help people. To help people come to Jesus. To help people trust Jesus. To help people believe in Jesus. To help people surrender to Him and trust Him. That's what the anointing's for. So let's break it down. Number one. To preach the gospel. Mark chapter 1 verse 14 and 15. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. So there's an important part. The gospel is for now. Amen. Today. Yes. It's good news for today. The time is fulfilled. Then he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom is present. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent means change your mind. 
Change what you believe. Change your thinking. When, we're, when our mind changes, that's what it means. To metanoia, to change, means change your mind. And instead of unbelieving, start believing. That's the gospel message. So Jesus is coming with a message of the kingdom. And he's, he's telling everybody, stop thinking the way you do. Stop believing what you do. That's called repent. Change your mind and start believing what I say. Amen. That's what Jesus, that's what the gospel is. So the time is fulfilled. We'll get into that. But all healing, all deliverance, all liberty comes from believing the gospel. It comes from changing our mind, stop our unbelief and believe. Stop our wrong thinking and think right. And when we do that, we get healed. We get delivered. We get freedom. We get sight. We'll break that down. But let's look at the first part. Now we're just focusing right now on the anointing to preach the gospel. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 says, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It's not yesterday. It's not tomorrow. It's today. Today is the day of salvation. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15 says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the wilderness, in the rebellion. So, so the gospel is a now gospel. That's what he said. The time is fulfilled. We're going to break it down again. The kingdom of God is at hand. In Luke 17, verse 20 and 21, Jesus said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. So the kingdom of God is present. It's at hand. And the, the kingdom of God begins when we receive that Jesus is Lord. He's Savior. He suffered, died, buried, paid my sins, rose from the dead. He's the Lord. I receive him. I trust him. The kingdom, then I'm born again. And the kingdom begins inside me. It doesn't come with observation. It's inside of us. The kingdom is the rule and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ inside of our heart. It's not a doctrine. It's not a set of doctrines. The devil believes those doctrines, but he doesn't have the kingdom. We can memorize doctrines. We can memorize Jesus died, Jesus came, Jesus rose. That doesn't save us. But receiving Jesus in our heart as Lord and Savior, now the kingdom is within us. He's the one that we follow. He's our Lord. In John 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So the kingdom starts inside. And the kingdom grows. As we follow him, his rule and his reign increases. It's progressive. It's called the sanctification of the soul, where our mind is renewed and our will is surrendered. And so the kingdom is, so he said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom's at hand. In other words, what is the kingdom? Wherever Jesus is king. So if he's king in our heart, then the kingdom is in us. If he's on our lips, but he's not king in our heart, the kingdom's not in us. Jesus said, why? Do you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. So the kingdom's inside. It starts inside. It's going to grow. And eventually the kingdom will come fully and externally when the Lord Jesus Christ comes and appears and manifests his kingdom on the earth. Amen. Now, we're to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's where our faith starts. He came, he bore our sicknesses, he bore our sins. He suffered, he died, he rose from the dead. He's Lord and he calls us to follow him. That's the kingdom. The kingdom also comes when he appears. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2. Paul writes to Timothy, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So Paul charged Timothy to preach that Jesus Christ, his kingdom starts in us, but it's also coming physically to the earth as part of the gospel of the kingdom. He's coming to the earth to set up his rule and reign. 
And when he does, he's coming to judge the living and the dead. That's part of the gospel. Part of the gospel is understanding the kingdom starts inside of us and the kingdom's coming in fullness externally. And when he comes and he appears, he's going to judge the living and the dead. So our walk now is to prepare ourselves so that we're ready for that day. So we're looking at right now the gospel. We're going to get into healing the brokenhearted, setting captives free. We're just looking right now that the anointing is on us to preach the gospel. So the gospel, Jesus said, the time is fulfilled. Repent. Repent means change your mind, change your direction. Romans 1, 5. Paul writes, through him, through Christ, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. What does that mean, obedience to the faith? We're commanded to believe the gospel. We're commanded to believe the word of God. We're commanded to believe and to live a lifestyle of faith in God's word. That's, our, that's the command. The apostleship was to bring people to obedience to the faith. Obedience to trust him. Obedience. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's what it means to change our mind. When we lived apart from Christ, we lived in uh, futility. Peter calls our life aimless conduct. He said we've been redeemed from our aimless conduct, not by the blood of bulls and goats, but by the precious blood of the Lamb. So now we're not doing our own thing, our own aimless conduct. We're now living. We've come into, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's the lover of our soul. He's our redeemer. And he's our Lord and our King and our Savior. And now we're going to live by faith in his word. That's what it means, repent. I'm going to change my mind and start believing what his word says. Amen. Believe. So he said, repent. And this is a simple gospel message. The simple gospel is this. Stop thinking and believing what you're thinking. Sh repent. And start believing and thinking and living by what the Bible says. Amen. That's repent and believe. Believe. Start with the words in red. The words of Jesus. Jesus said, whoever keeps my word, John 14, 23, is the one that loves me. My father and I will love him and come and make our home with him. So when we love the word of God, we're loving the Lord. When we keep the word, we're keeping the Lord in our heart. Because he said, when we keep his word, he makes his abode in us. Now, he is the light of the world. Uh, John 8, 12. I'm the light of the world. He that follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. But his word, is Psalm 119, tells us, uh, I believe, verse 105, that his word is a lamp and a light to our feet and our path. So Jesus is the light and he's the word. And his word is the light. And Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my word. And if you keep my word, I'll abide in you. So when he said, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have light. That means follow his word, which is a light and a lamp to our feet and our path. So we believe his word. We believe that we've, in a nutshell, we believe this. What, what the gospel message says. All of us have sinned. All of us, Romans 3, 23. All of us like sheep have gone astray, everyone to his own way. There's none righteous. No, not one. We believe that. See, when we don't believe the gospel, we believe like the humanist secular world. We're all good. We're not good. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. The human heart is deceitful. Who can know it? So, so we believe, we change our mind and we believe what God says. God says, all have sinned, there's none righteous. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death. Yes. Revelation 20, 14 says, the second death is the lake of fire. Hebrews 9, 27 says, 
It's appointed unto men to die once, and after this, the judgment. This is part of the gospel. If we don't change our mind and believe, now people think this is bad news, but you have to believe the bad news before you can believe the good news. Because if you don't believe the bad news, the good news isn't good news to you. The good news is just an, an, an inconvenience to a self-centered life. In darkness on its way to perdition. But the good news starts with bad news. The good news starts with bad news. And the bad news is this, but it's not really bad news. It just seems like bad news to the fallen sinful man. All have sinned. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Every one to our own way. There's no one righteous, not one. The human heart is wicked, it's deceitful. But we're loved by God. In that dark, fallen, sinful condition, God loves us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So we're in sin. The wages of sin is death. The second death is the lake of fire. It's appointed unto men to die once. After that, the judgment. That's where we all start. And then the good news comes. And it says that God sent His Son into the world and laid on Him, Isaiah 53, 6, the iniquity of us all. He made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin. He made Him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That's good news. That's good news. That God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. For here's, that's the gospel. The gospel says God is not willing that any should perish. The gospel is believing the word of God, that God takes no pleasure, he says in Ezekiel 18 and Ezekiel 33. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that he turn and live. So we believe that. We believe that God laid on him the iniquity of us all. We believe, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 3, that Jesus paid for our sins by his death on the cross. We believe, according to Romans 4, 25, that he rose from the dead. We believe, according to Acts 10, 36, that Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth. We believe, according to John 14, 6, that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except by Him. We believe that a lifestyle of believing in Him, we, we live that by following Him, and we follow Him by following His Word. He said in John 8, 12, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. He didn't say whoever says a sinner's prayer. That's a good thing to do. That's a starting place. But if we pray the prayer and don't follow him, we're still in darkness. He said, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. That means read his word and believe it and try to apply it. And how can I follow him if I'm not reading his word? I can't follow him. So this is the gospel message. And we're, we're, learn, we're to learn to live by every word Jesus said in Matthew 4.4. 4, that we're to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Amen. We're to believe that he's coming again to ju judge the living and the dead. According to Acts 10.42 and 2 Timothy 4.12. So in a nutshell, that's the gospel. The gospel is man is sinful. Man is fallen. There's a judgment day coming. Man can't pay our sin debt. God loves man. God sent Jesus. Jesus was innocent. He took our burden of sin upon him. God made him who knew no sin to become sin. He suffered, died, buried, shed his blood, was buried. On the third day, rose from the dead. He's victorious over sin, over death. And he calls all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17, <clears throat> verse 30 and 31. In times past, God winked at our ignorance, but now he commands all men to repent because God has appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man Christ Jesus. So the reason God's calling people to repent is this. He said a day, a judgment day. He said, repent, 
Change your mind. Turn. Believe in Him and start living by every word that comes out of His mouth because there's a judgment day coming. That's the good news. That's a good... Now, Jesus said the, the Spirit of God was upon Him and anointing Him to proclaim what I just told you. And the Spirit of God is upon you to anoint you to say what I just said. And I encourage you, get this CD or watch the message again on YouTube. Hear it two or three or four times until it gets in you. And then you'll have it in your heart. And when it's in your heart, it'll just come out. Amen. Now, he's, he's anointed. We're, we're called to do the work of the ministry. All saints, all believers are. All believers are called to testify of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Agreed? So we can't testify unless we study it and become familiar with it and understand it and know what it is. And the best way to know is to practice living it. Then you'll really know. Because if you practice living the gospel, you'll understand it. The Bible says, great understanding have they who do thy commandments. So when you practice doing it, you get understanding. Then you understand, now I understand what it means that all have sinned. Now I understand what it means. Now I understand what it means I can do nothing apart from Christ. I understand that now. How did I understand that? Because I tried to do his commandments. And I found out I can't do anything without him. I understand. Great understanding have they who do thy commandments. So, so we're anointed to preach the gospel. Please take time. It's good that you're hearing this message, but it, you must hear it two or three or four or five times. Write down the scriptures. Meditate on them. Get it in your heart so that you can be equipped to easily convey in two or three minutes the gospel message to somebody. God, it's not just God loves you. Yes, God loves you, but it's God loves you. But you need to understand what his word says. Our minds need to change. We need to change our thinking. We've, we're, we've sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. A judgment day is set. God has commanded us to repent. Believe the good news. We're loved. We're redeemed. God has a plan and a purpose. So now he goes on. The Spirit of God is upon me to preach the gospel. So we just covered that in a nutshell. The next thing is to heal the brokenhearted. Now, healing of the brokenhearted comes from the preaching of the gospel. That's the beginning of it. Because receiving Jesus in our life is the beginning of the healing of the broken heart. Now, when you talk about healing the broken heart, freedom to the captives, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, all of those things are come under the gospel. Believing, repenting and believing the gospel gives us access to, to receive all these healings of the broken heart, freedom from the, uh, oppression and sight to the blind. All that comes from believing the gospel. So to minister healing to the broken hearted, freedom to the captives, sight to the blind, liberty to the oppressed, that's demonized, Demonized doesn't mean demon-possessed. There's degrees. Christians can be demonized when the demons are oppressing us. Okay? But now we want to know how to minister to people to heal broken hearts and set captives free. Right? In a nutshell, it boils down to this. It's identifying the area of our life that hasn't repented and is not believing the word. Okay? That's where healing comes from. Is identi identifying the part of our life that hasn't repented hasn't, and is not believing the word. And when, through the Holy Spirit's guidance and, and coupled with that are the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the impartations of God's love and His grace. Those are coupled together with discovering where we're not Repenting or believing. We'll get into that. So healing the broken hearted. That means this. Broken hearted is afflicted. Bruised. Broken. When we repent from our own ways. And we obey the word. 
When we receive Christ and we commit to following him, we are commanded to love God and love our neighbor. That means, and love ourselves. That means forgive ourselves, forgive our neighbor. And this is where healing for the brokenhearted comes. It comes from, uh, brokenness comes from oftentimes our own sin that then brings demonic condemnation, demonic oppression, and demonic lies that torment us. And then what happens is people start believing their emotions and their feelings more than the Word of God. And their heart feels broken. It's people start living out of a broken heart. Not sometimes from their own sin, sometimes not from their own sin. People get sinned against. People get abused verbally, emotionally, physically, sexually. People get hurt. They get backstabbed. They get betrayed. They get lied about. Hurts and wounds happen. Then, then what happens is that heart, rather than follow obedience to the Word of God, starts reacting out of pain. And so then, uh, like... When a wound is in the natural, if it's not treated, it can get infected. Flies can come. The demonic comes to oppress areas of sin. Our own sin or sins that were done against us. Okay? So that's where their broken heart comes from. For example, someone can be abused. And then the devil tells them, that happened because you're worthless. Because you're no good. Or their parent leaves. Say, well, if you were a valuable person, your parent wouldn't leave. Or divorce happened, or whatever. Hurts happen, and people start believing their emotions, their pain, and the lies of the devil more than the gospel. So healing for the brokenhearted is an anointing of the Holy Spirit, and oftentimes it's accompanied by gifts of the Holy Spirit. A word of knowledge, word of wisdom. To help unlock the area of the person's life where they're not believing the gospel. That's what healing the brokenhearted is. And ultimately, healing happens from walk when we choose to walk in love. That's where healing happens. And I'll give you a verse for it. First Peter 1 Peter 1.22 since you have purified your souls. Now the word purify in the Greek, it means morally cleanse and to sanctify. Your soul, uh, the Greek word is suke, where we get psyche from. It's a seat of feelings, desires, affections, your heart, your soul. So to purify means to cleanse and make whole your heart. You've done that. How? You have purified your soul. You've made your heart whole and clean. There's no more bitterness, no more self-pity, no more heaviness, no more negativity. It's cleansed. How? You obeyed the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. Okay, so the wounded heart is a heart that got hurt and the pain has eclipsed the person's obedience. So we're no longer thinking, love the enemy, bless them, pray for them. We're thinking, I'm in pain. That's why Jesus said, if we're going to follow him, the first requirement is to deny self. We can't be a follower of Christ if we're self-absorbed. And that includes being treated unjustly. What I'm saying is not, I'm not not being compassionate. The only way to healing is to repent and, and forgive. We have to forgive. It's in forgiving that we get made whole. Amen. It's in loving our enemies that we get made whole. That the heart, it's in forgiving ourselves. It's in trusting God. It's in trust. Why did that happen to me? My life could have been this, you know. Hey, God's sovereign. Trust Him. It's a healing. 
of the broken heart. So we're anointed. So to heal a broken heart is to, is to pray and to be led by the Holy Spirit to help the person that you're ministering to find the area in their life that they're not really trusting God. That's what it boils down to. To trust, meaning if we don't trust God, we won't obey him. Agreed? When we don't trust, we close our heart, we withdraw, we become self-protective, and then our heart never gets healed. So we have, to, you've purified your soul, your heart's become healthy because you've obeyed the truth in sincere love. And I told you this story years ago, uh, T.L. Osborne, a great evangelist, uh, I heard him tell this story back in, I believe, 1982. Uh, he and his wife had just come back from Africa, brokenhearted. They buried their 34-year-old son, who was a minister of the gospel. He died, I think, from kidney failure. They ended up burying him in Africa. He said, we came back, we were so brokenhearted. See, people get brokenhearted from all kinds of things. He said, we didn't even know how we could keep going on and preach the gospel. And he said, Christmas time was coming up. We couldn't even bear the thought of having Christmas without our son. We were sitting there moping around the house. And, I, and T.L. said, I said to Daisy, Daisy, we've got to get out of this. What shall we do? He said, we need to go find somebody who's hurting more than we are and go help them. Now, Listen, it says, you have purified your soul. Again, that you've made, you sanctified and cleansed your heart. That's a healed heart. In obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren. So he said, we knew some missionary, young missionary couple that had really was struggling on the mission field in France. And so we decided to forget all about ourselves, fly over to them, to France bring them some gifts, spend time with them, take them out to dinner, speak into them and encourage them and just build them up. He said, so he said, forget about our pain. And they did that. They flew to France and just spent a week pouring love into this young missionary couple that was struggling on the mission field, built them up. T.L. said, by the end of the week, our hearts were completely healed. All the brokenness was gone. So there's an anointing to help people to get their heart healed. If we will come back, we're going to come back later and touch on the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the next session, accessing the gifts, ministering the gifts, because oftentimes the gifts of the Holy Spirit are involved in healing the broken heart. So that's an anointing. So you can claim this. Now, when you're ministering to someone who has a broken heart in any way, people that are taken to sexual dysfunction, homosexuality, all kinds of gender dysphoria. People are confused. The root of it, nine times out of ten, is a broken heart. And then a demon comes and brings them into darkness and confusion. So this is what I've, I've practiced for years. Is when I'm sitting down with someone, I claim this promise. When I pray with them, I'll say, Lord, now let the anointing to heal the brokenhearted come. Because that's one of the purpose for the anointing. Is when you're sitting with a brokenhearted person... There's an anointing of the Holy Spirit to heal them. And you can claim it. And you can expect gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can ask for words of knowledge. Come on, somebody. Amen. Ask the Lord. Lord, you've, you, I need your anointing. Jesus, now listen. Jesus Christ himself didn't do any miracles until after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Agreed? He didn't believe, begin his public ministry until after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. So when we minister to people, claim the promise to say, Holy Spirit, I ask for your anointing right now to heal the brokenhearted. And when you do that, God will give you words of knowledge. He'll give you insight. If your motive is to be a nameless, faceless, humble person that ministers the love of God. If your motive is, God, help me, Lord, to set this person free. God will give you the keys. Amen. Amen. 
Again, I've told, I know I've told this testimony a number of times, but it bears repeating. Uh, it's one of the most dramatic ones. We've, many times we've prayed with people that have come at our emergency grocery distribution. A lady came years ago. She stood up here. She said, I need prayer for a depression. I'm, I've been seriously and clinically depressed for five years. And long story short, when I prayed for her, God gave me a word. and I just heard the word unforgiveness. So I asked her, who hurt you? And it came out, it was her brother. She said, I'll never forgive him for what he did to me. I didn't ask her what it was. Five years, she said, I'll never forgive him. The anger on her face. I, I, now here's where the anointing to heal the broken heart is. I explained to her, you don't have to agree with what he did. But I, and I showed her out of Matthew 18 that if you, the reason why you're de, oh, depressed is it says that, that you'll be turned over to demons that will torment you if you have unforgiveness. I showed her from the word. So what I was doing, the Holy Spirit would help me identify the area in her life that was not surrendered to Christ so that she could repent, change her mind and believe. And when she did, she got free. So we led her. So, so there's a, a gift, a word of knowledge comes into playing. So I led her in a prayer. First, then I taught her the word. That's why all the healing for their bodies, healing for the soul, freedom from demons, it all has its foundation in the word. He sent his word and healed them. So I taught her the word. She saw it. I led her in prayer. She was instantly set free of depression. Her heart was healed of all the heaviness and all the brokenness. All the bitterness was gone and the love of God came in her heart. So that's the healing of the broken heart. And at the same time, that's also letting the oppressed go free. She was oppressed by a demon. Okay, so there's the healing. Now, I'm, I know I'm going over this quickly. The next one is freedom to the captives. Now, there's an anointing for that. So when you minister to people and freedom to the captives, I, uh, to me, I, I see that as addictions, bondages, sin bondages, uh, could be addiction to food, addiction to drugs, addiction to pornography. Uh, people are bound in sin, bound in bitterness, bound in... This, this is what it's speaking about. It's, people are taken captive. They're not getting free in their walk with God. So, the, so you have to understand there's an anointing for you. Everyone say there's an anointing for me. There's an anointing for you to set captives free. So when you pray or minister to someone, ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, give me your anointing to help this person get free. If your motive is to help them, God will do it. Okay? So again, uh, that almost always comes from... Um, an area of someone's life that is not submitted to the Word of God. This is where sin bondages come from. Uh, it can be a lie the devil told someone. Uh, see, God says things like, uh, you're accepted in the beloved. You're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's the truth of the gospel. Uh, uh, Ephesians 1, 3. Ephesians 2, uh, 6 says that you're seated with him in the heavenly places. 2 Peter chapter 1 says he's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. And um, Jeremiah 1 says before, now it's a true of Jeremiah, it's true of you, that before you were formed in the womb, God knew you. Uh, Psalm 136 says that all your days were written in a book. So that's very positive. And, and that God loves you. And that um, he gave Christ as payment for you to redeem you. So that's all gospel truth. But bondage comes when we hear it, but we don't believe it. And we, and we start believing a lie from the devil. I can't get ahead. I'm not blessed. It won't work for me. What's the use? God doesn't hear my prayers. So that's a sin. Unbelief is a sin. It's not a little sin. It's a big sin. I'm not saying, not, not for this condemnation. What I mean, I don't want anyone to get under condemnation over that. Unbelief is not a little thing. It stops us from the flow of God. 
So setting people free from addictions some, or, or, or some kind of captivity to sin, a lot of times it's connected with a bitter root judgment. We're bitter against somebody. There's bitterness somewhere. There's a judgment and bitterness. Now, why I say that is 1 John chapter 2 says, He that loves his brother walks in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling. Okay? But he who doesn't love his brother is in, walks in the darkness. Okay? So, stumbling into sin and continual stumbling into sin, the root of it almost always is relational. I'm mad at somebody. I'm holding a grudge at somebody. I'm, I'm nursing an offense. And so now you're in dark. You don't, you're in darkness. It says, he that walks in darkness stumbles and doesn't know where he's going. So to help someone get free from an addiction or a bondage, uh, if someone's got a pornography addiction or something, they've, they've probably got some other issue going on. And they have no peace with God in their heart. Because you're not walking in the light. Because when you walk in the light, there's a buoyancy in your spirit. And the light gives you the strength. When you walk in the light, you don't stumble. It says, he that loves his brother walks in the light. There's no cause for stumbling. So that's another thing to pray about when we're trying to help people get free from sin. Just how's your relationships? Who hurt you? Who are you mad at? What's going on? You know? Because when, when love is flowing, your heart's light and full of light. When your heart's full of light, you have, your flesh can be under control. But anyway, there's a, a lot of reasons. I can't cover all of it. So the anointing to set captives free. Again, when we pray with people, we're going to help people. I'm stuck in this. A lot of times, it's... Uh, Someone doesn't get free. Here's another reason. Because they won't acknowledge that what they're doing is a sin. And when we confess our sin, confess means to say the same as God says. Homologia. It, confess a sin come, means to come into agreement with God and say, what I'm doing is sinful. It's wrong. I confess it as sin. I acknowledge it. I repent of it. When we do that, God's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us. So sometimes people are in bondage to a sin because they won't admit that that's a sin. People want to justify what they're doing. Help me, somebody. So helping people get free is, is the Holy Spirit has to guide us. It has to be done in love, in love, without condemnation, full of grace, but to help identify Discover the area where the person is not believing the word, submitting to the word, or obeying God. And help lead them into obedience and to faith. And they get free. That's the anointing. There's an anointing for that. How many want to help people get free? Freedom for the captives. We don't... Uh, Is it making sense? Then the next anointing, Jesus said, uh, well, part of freedom for the captives also is physical healing. So we'll talk about that for a couple of minutes. I don't know if I'm going too long. I have to split this up into two messages. But that's the anointing. Luke 4, 18, there is an anointing. Every believer should be encouraged that when you pray, the Spirit of God is upon you. He's upon you to, to anoint you to preach the gospel. To anoint you to set captives free. To anoint you to heal broken hearts. I've just learned this over the years. When I'm with somebody, in my mind, in my heart, I just pray, Lord, I need your anointing right now. God knows better than I. I can't do anything without him. Lord, I need a word of knowledge. I need a word of counsel. I need a word of wisdom. I need your guidance. I've never, anytime I pray that, if your motive is love, I've never seen God not answer. He'll always guide you. If your motive is love. So let's talk about physical healing. Maybe we'll, 
And then we'll, next time we'll, we'll finish this out. And then we'll, um, I want to get into the practicals of the gifts of the Holy Spirit for uh, setting people free. Physical healing is part of freedom to the captives because physical infirmity and sickness is a bondage. It's a burden. It is. It's a pain. Physically a pain. Now, we have to know how to minister healing to people. A lot of people need healing. A lot of people need healing. Okay? It's not necessarily how loud you pray. It's not how long you pray. It's not, what, not a formula. I bind, I do this, I blow a shofar. And it's not all that stuff. It's believing the word. Okay? So for ministering physical healing to people, we have to have faith. And faith has its foundation in the word. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing the word. So ignorance of the word, indifference toward the word, laziness regarding the word means weak faith. So if you want to minister healing, you have to invest time putting the word of healing in your heart. Because faith comes from hearing the word. Remember, all of this Luke 418 anointing starts with, I'm anointed to preach the word. So everything that follows is the word. In fact, it says in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus sat down to teach, what's he teaching? The word. It says the power of the Lord was present to heal. Because the word and spirit work together to heal. It says he sent his word to heal them of all their destruction. Psalm 107 verse 20. So the foundation for ministering healing to people is the word of God. I make it a habit. So I pray corporately. If I pray for an individual, before I pray for people, I'll always spend a minute or two or three or four speaking the word. The word has power. Amen. Amen. Uh, in other words, if someone needs healing, I'll tell him before I pray for them. I'll say, Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Will you, will you, I'll tell him, will you bless the Lord with me? Yes. Let's thank him. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all your sins? Who heals all your diseases? I believe that. I live by that. I literally live by the word of God when it comes to healing. Amen. I have to. If I don't, I probably wouldn't be alive. It's a blessing. It's a blessing to live by the word of God. Okay? So like Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases. That's, a, that's enough for me right there. Lord, you heal all my diseases. It's part of our salvation. Isaiah 53. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was smitten, stricken, afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. Our iniquities, he laid our iniquities upon him. He bore our sicknesses, that's a, a Hebrew word, and carried our pains. It says griefs and sorrows. But if you look it up in the Hebrew, it says sicknesses and pains. That's the Hebrew word. I don't know why they put griefs and sorrows. And it is physical healing that he bore. Because in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, when evening was come, they brought to him many that were demon possessed. And he cast out the spirit with his word. There it is again. The word made the demons come out. Amen. And he healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Himself bore our sicknesses, carried our pains. So there's physical healing. So the word bore in the Hebrew that he bore our sicknesses, carried our pains, is the same word in Isaiah 53 verse 12 that says he bore our iniquities. Bore means he lifted off of us and carried it away. So the same Hebrew word that whatever he did to our iniquities, he did for our sicknesses and pains. And you have to believe that. And you have to make a decision and just say, I believe the word of God. I believe the Word of God. I'm going to live by faith in the Word of God. And sometimes you have to be painted into a corner. You've got to be backed into a corner and you have nothing else to go to. You have nowhere else to go for help. 
You only can look up. And then you'll make a decision. Say, I guess I'll believe God. Amen. And so sometimes God helps us get there. Because when we have too many options, we don't believe him. Just call the doctor, take the pills, do this, take some more Advil, ignore it, but it doesn't go away. Or we look at the word, believe the word, thank God for the word, speak the word, and receive the blessing of the word. Now, it doesn't always come overnight. We inherit the promises through faith and patience. Sometimes you have to keep believing while you still hurt. Then you make a decision. I'll keep trusting his word while my body's hurting. Because I believe God's not a liar. Well, so there's, so there's a foundation for the word, for healing. And that's the word. Isaiah 53, he bore sicknesses. 1 Peter 2.24, by his stripes we were healed. It's interesting, in Isaiah 53, centuries before Christ came, it says, by his stripes we are healed. It reached up to the cross and brought it to the presence. present. It says, we are healed. And then after the cross, Peter wrote, 1 Peter 2.24, we were healed. If we were, we are. Romans 8.11, the spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives inside your mortal body. He will give life to your mortal body. That's the word of God. We have to believe this. And I want to just say something right now. We are at the end of the age. We're in the place of birth pangs. We're, there's times coming. Who knows if you're going to have access to any medicine? Who knows if you're going to have access to any doctors? We better start practicing now living by the word of God. And living by faith and speaking faith. I'm serious. And so, when we pray for healing, it starts with the Word of God. If I'm going to minister healing to somebody, I want to find out if they have any faith. And if they don't, I want to help build their faith before I pray for them. So I'll tell them the Word. Have you received the Lord? Have you? Well, why are you asking Him for a healing? Why don't you receive the healer first? I mean, God can still heal unbelievers. I'm not going to not pray for them. But it always helps to lead someone to receive the healer. I have people call here sometimes. You know, we have a food bank. We have for almost 30 years. 25 plus years. We've, we've fed thousands of people. And I thank God and I give him all the glory. He's the one that's provided it. We've given away tons and tons of groceries month after month for decades. So we're used to having people call us and ask, how oh, can you, so, you know, people will call strangers. Say, do you have, a, do you have money for, a, can you pay my bills, my gas bill this month? Can you help my water bill? And I'll ask them, I'll be very sweet and very nice to them. I said, can I ask you a question? Yes. I said, do you have a church? Do you go to church anywhere? They said, no. I said, okay, that's, I understand. How is it? I said, I just would like to know. Um, how do you feel about never going to thank God? Never going to church to thank him or acknowledge him? Never going to worship him or study his word? But when you want money to call up and ask God's people to give you money. How do you feel about that? And I don't say it for condemnation. I say it to make people think. I said, and then I'll tell them. You know, first of all, we don't have money to just pay people's bills. I tell them I have groceries. If you need groceries, come and I'll help get your groceries and we'll give you. And um, we always do. But the thing is, uh, what I try to tell people is if you're, they say, well, I'm going through a really hard time. I said, well, I'll tell you how to get out of it. If you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he'll add everything to you. Rather than just come or live your own life and only when you're in need, God give me something, then go back to your own life. I tell them this. If you'll give your life to, look for him. He's a good God. Seek him. He didn't say, he didn't say if you're perfect by next Tuesday, I'll meet your needs. If, he did, if that was the case, we'd all starve. He said, just seek me first. 
That means in our weakness, in my imperfection, if I'll just point the right direction and start going after him, he'll meet all my needs. And I tell people that because what good does it do to just give them something and not give them the word? And I have had people, if you say it with love and kindness and gentleness, I've had people say, you know what? You're right. I think I need to, um, you really made me start thinking. So we need to give people the word. Okay, let me finish for tonight. We'll break this down. We'll, next time we'll go further. But let's talk about healing. Minister healing. We must have a foundation in our heart. Are you, is it settled in your heart that God wants to heal? Is it settled in your heart that Jesus paid for our sins and our healing? I mean, Romans 8, 11 is a great verse. It says, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will give life to our mortal body. That means as we go through life, he'll keep quickening and, and imparting life to our bodies. Okay, so here's how we pray. We pray with love and with faith. Uh, the reason love is because the kingdom of God is love. God is love. And if we abide in love, God abides in us. And we abide in him. And Galatians 5, 6 says, faith works by love. But when we pray in Mark chapter 11, verse 23, and we'll finish with this. Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, if you write in your Bible, you might underline the word says, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says, you could underline that word says again, he will have whatever he says. So three times Jesus said, whoever says to the mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea, it does not doubt in his heart, but believes that the things that he says will be done, he'll have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So if we believe that Jesus Christ paid for our sicknesses and our sins, then we can pray with faith. We can pray according to Mark 16 that says they will lay hands on the sick. They will recover. Right? Okay. I like to share the word of God with the people. Then pray for them and believe when I pray at the moment that I pray, I see in my mind's eye, in my heart with faith, I see healing. Now, now Jesus said, when you pray, believe. And then he said, say to the mountain, be removed and don't doubt, but believe that the things that you have, you'll and believe that things that you say will happen and you'll have it. That's what Jesus said. Now, Jesus knows what he's talking about when it comes to ministering, right? He's telling us how to do it. So the way to do it is don't doubt when you pray, believe when you pray. See, Okay, I'm going to pray for someone. They have a big lump on their arm. It hurts. They're in pain. I, I believe when I pray that with his stripes they're healed, that the spirit of God in them will give life to their mortal body. So if I believe that I'm, my prayer is answered, when I'm praying, I believe I'm heard, then I'm going to speak to that thing. This is how you minister healing. Now, when Jesus ministered to Peter's mother-in-law, he went into Peter's house, his mother-in-law was sick in bed with a fever. He did not pray for her to get better. The Bible says he rebuked the fever. That means he talked to the fever. When Jesus was in the boat and a storm came and the disciples were afraid of, of going under, Jesus did not pray, Father, calm the storm. He did not. He spoke to the waves and to the wind. When Jesus came to the fig tree, he didn't pray, Father, make this fig tree have no more figs. He didn't do that. He spoke to the tree. And Jesus is telling us how to pray and believe we receive and then talk. Now, Jesus prayed for Lazarus to be raised from the dead before he came to the tomb. Because when he came, he said, Father, I know you always hear me. I'm just saying this for their sake. Meaning he already asked the Father to raise him from the dead. He already believed he received. But he said, for their sake, I'm saying this, Father. And then he didn't say, he didn't say, oh, Father, let him come out of the grave. He didn't say that. He just spoke to him. Lazarus, come forth. So Jesus told us how to minister healing. Pray in our heart. Believe we receive. Lord, 
I ask you to release your healing virtue in this person right now in the name of Jesus. Well, I believe God heard me. I believe that. Now I speak to that growth. Go in Jesus' name. And he said, don't doubt, but believe the things that you say will come to pass. You'll have what you say. That's how we minister healing. And if you believe, and if you're receiving prayer, you're to believe. That means when you get prayer, and you walk away from the prayer line, and the lump doesn't instantly go away, you don't go home and call the 800 prayer line, and call the other 800 prayer line, and call four other people and say, keep praying for me. That's called the prayer of unbelief. Help me, somebody. So if we minister healing, we minister it out of love and faith. Now, when Jesus ministered healing, it says he was moved with compassion. That's the most important because faith works by love. The more love that God puts in our heart, the more faith will be there. The more love you have from the whole, now it's not our love, it's his love. The more of the Holy Spirit love that's in our heart, the more faith we'll have. Faith works by love. That's sort of it. That we, well, there's more to go, but I don't have time to cover it all tonight. But we just started. We're talking about Luke 4, 18, getting the saints equipped. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said. I want to say the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Thank you, Madeline. I'm going to say that again and give all of you a chance to agree. I want to say the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Amen. He has anointed you. The Lord has anointed you to preach the gospel. Whoever's watching online, the Spirit of God is upon you. He's anointed you to preach the gospel. He's anointed you. He sent you to heal the brokenhearted. To help people that have been hurt. Help them discover the grace of God. Help them learn how to obey the gospel. Help them learn how to receive forgiveness and give forgiveness. That's how they, you get your broken heart healed. Hell, and we're to proclaim liberty to the captives. Now notice it says proclaim. It's what Jesus did to the woman that was bowed over with an issue of blood 18 years. He said, woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. He proclaimed freedom. Amen. Isn't that awesome? He proclaimed it. Say, I'm, I'm, I'm anointed. The Spirit of God is upon me. Now, I'm going to give you a chance to say it better. I really believe this. I really believe this. I really believe the Spirit of God is upon me. Do you believe the Spirit of God is upon you? Yes. Say, the Spirit of God is upon me. The Spirit of God is upon He's anointed me, anointed me to proclaim freedom to the captives, to the sight to the blind, to, the blind. to heal the brokenhearted, to, broken to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. God is with me. God was with Jesus of Nazareth. He anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good. Healing all who were oppressed to the devil. God's anointed me. With the Holy Spirit and power. To go out and do good. And set free all who are oppressed to the devil. In the name of Jesus. I am getting equipped. By the word of God. I am who God says I am. Christ is in me. The hope of glory. When I lay my hands on the sick. They will recover. In the name of Jesus. Demons will come out. God will give me all the grace. He'll give me all the gifts I need to help people, to get them free, to learn to trust God so they can walk with God in the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you for hearing us tonight. Thank you for your anointing. Come on and give him praise.